Dr. Ann Weaver Hart, thanks for sitting down with us today. My pleasure. Lawmakers passed a budget that cuts $100 million from the university system. What will the impact of those cuts be on the University of Arizona? Those cuts include about 14% reduction in the general and education funding available to the University of Arizona for the education of our students. It's not 14% of every nickel we spend, but it's 14% of the discretionary revenue that we have to spend on our general education mission. So they're significant. And on top of the 400 million plus cuts to higher education that occurred in the fiscal 09 year and have had huge implications, we're going to have to look very, very carefully at how we move forward for the university and implement the vision that has been so strong here while we also make tough choices about what we do spend those scarce resources on. And that's right where we are right now in conversations with the Strategic Planning and Budget Advisory Committee and in discussions with our finance team, with our deans, and with others. ASU President Michael Crow has said that the cuts signal that higher education is a low priority in the state. Do you agree with that assessment? I think that's a simplistic assessment. Uh, President Crow obviously has very strong feelings about that. I think that the political philosophy on which the current leaders ran for office was clear to all the voters, and that that political philosophy, which minimizes revenue and maximizes deregulation and private enterprise, was what we all knew it was going to be. So it wasn't a surprise that the current leadership chose to reject every option for increasing revenue and to make the adjustments that it saw as necessary to balance the budget from a reduction in expenditures. What it does mean to me is that we need a long-range plan for the role of public higher education in the state of Arizona. And I would treasure the opportunity to be a part of a conversation about what that long-range plan needs to look like and how we can continue to fill the tremendous role that we fill now in our Arizona economy, but also in the lives of its citizens. And do you expect to have that opportunity? I'm sure asking for it every chance I get. I, I think that it would be a very important thing for our political leaders to organize in order to set a long range, not a year to year approach to how we make these tough decisions. And how will the University of Arizona be coping with the cuts? Will we see an increase in tuition and fees next year? Well, you've asked a complicated question and then limited it. We will examine every option. We have a guaranteed tuition plan, as you know. So our students who are on the guaranteed tuition plan already have a guarantee of no increase in tuition. We've already made a commitment under the leadership of Senior Vice President Dr. Melissa Vito to incl include mandatory fees in that guaranteed program. We've already made a commitment to our graduate students to have pilot professional master's degrees included in a similar program of guaranteed cost to which we would commit and the student would commit. Those aren't going to go away. So when we look at tuition and fees, it's in the context of a four-year commitment to both undergraduate and graduate students. This isn't a one-year decision. This is a long-term commitment. We have a long-range academic and business plan. We know what the variables in that very complex plan are, and we're going to have to look at all the choices together, not independently. You've said that the U of A will eliminate peripheral, peripheral activities and concentrate on its core mission. What do you mean by that exactly? And can you give me some well, specific I, examples? I need to correct you. I didn't say that we would eliminate peripheral activities. I said that when we look at the hard choices that have to be made, we should focus on student services, direct student services, whether that's counseling or direct instruction. That's what we need to focus on first. And then we need to look at core mission. We have an absolute commitment to our land grant mission. We are going to continue to nurture and develop cooperative extension. We are the university in Arizona 
with allopathic medical schools. We have two. Those are core to our mission. Peripheral might be some of the community activities that we subsidize. We have to raise those questions. Didn't say eliminated. Said that when we make tough decisions, we have to look to the core. How would you characterize the current relationship between universities and lawmakers? Well, the lawmakers with whom I personally interacted were very cordial to me personally and sympathetic to the, the funding plight that public higher education faces. They were also very clear about their political philosophy. Again, that was not a surprise to any of us. And so I think that as the one sector that had a component in the state plan that was still not restricted by entitlements or other very, very tough commitments, that we ended up in a position where the lawmakers saw us as their only solution to a dilemma that developed because of decisions about revenue expansion and controlled expenditures. Not that there's hostility to higher ed. I didn't experience that. Not in the rhetoric and not in person. But in a, a tough choices kind of model within a political philosophy. And that's why I think that with a careful plan and a dialogue free of the immediacy of a budget, we'll be able to build a future where one can have a political, political philosophy a conservative political philosophy, and still find room for public higher education in the future of our state. So you're optimistic in the sort of medium to longer term? We well, have to be. I mean, we're all in this together. We can't eat our seed corn and then say, gosh, we're sorry to our kids when there's nothing there for them. This is not a choice. This is a commitment that we've made, and we may need to find new partners. We need to do business with others in different ways. Banner is a perfect example of that. We have a 30-year affiliation agreement, and we will sink or swim together, but we've made that commitment. We need more agreements like that, and we need to open the doors of our thinking about how we fulfill our mission and preserve the values that are so important to us. Adjunct and non-tenure track instructors participated in a recent nationwide walkout to protest pay and the terms of their contracts. What's the University of Arizona doing to, uh, to improve working conditions for them? It's in the mix and can't be considered separate from the other things we've been talking about. Uh, clearly adjunct faculty who teach a course or two a year and have other full-time jobs are very in a very different position than faculty whose only job is to teach courses at the university. Our full-time non-tenure track faculty have a job full-time with benefits and that's clearly a very different situation. So it, there isn't one solution. We have adjuncts whose primary employment is elsewhere and who bring in incredible richness from other experiences. We have full-time faculty whose entire workload is teaching. And that's a group that we have made a long-term commitment to. And in fact, our faculty senate includes those colleagues in membership in the senate. That's very different than short-timers who are teaching a handful of course-by-course -course commitments and who may be doing this in transition from one job to another or because that's the option that's available to them right now. So there is no one answer, and the, the role of everyone who works at the university is up for grabs now. Now, the, the demonstration was a national organization, and our teams joined in that discussion. It's on the table, and it's a part of the values that our community will need to confront. A number of the protesters complained that their, that their salaries have stagnated while those of top administrators at the university have increased over the past few years. How do you respond to that complaint? Well, personally, my salary is significantly less than it used to be. And I made the decision to come to the University of Arizona because I have such excitement about the future of this great institution. 
adjuncts who teach a course or two and in a short term, or even those who teach four or five courses, but in, on, the, on the way to another career that, that has full-time employment, are in a very, very different position than leaders who have devoted 30 and 40 years, gained the experience, gotten to the top of their field, working seven days a week, hours that you can't even imagine, and who are in a very, very different and frankly not comparable position. So I would argue that you can't compare apples to oranges. There are others who point out that high school English teachers who also teach seniors, writing, literary criticism, AP, make $31,000 here and teach five or six periods a day. So we could pick any comparator group we wanted. I think the issue for us at the University of Arizona is we are a community. Where does each contributor, be it faculty, staff, or student, fit in that community in a context as pretty hard choices? It isn't a choice-free environment. And frankly, our choices are between values, not good and evil. And that's the situation we find ourselves in. The U of A is in the middle of its, the largest capital campaign in its history. Where does it stand now? And do you have any recent highlights that you can share with us? Oh, we have some tremendous highlights. You probably heard about some of them. In general, we're past halfway in the total of the goal of 1.5 billion and about halfway in time, a little bit less. So tremendous support from the donor community. We have some incredible highlights. Uh, the Keras Mir Lab, $20 million going straight in to the Giant Magellan Telescope Project. The Agnes Howery gift, which we estimate will be about $50 million when, it, when the estate is, is finalized. All of those are contributions to the university directly and in areas the philanthropists have designated. They're quality additive that make the university even better at what we do. And thankfully, we also have tremendous support from philanthropists who make it possible for us to continue with world-class athletics in an environment where we are one of the few in the entire nation that actually have a, an athletics department that pretty much pays for itself while having many, many more sports than the few who generate revenue. So philanthropy pays plays an incredibly important part in our future and will play an increasingly large part in our ability to add that quality added component that isn't covered in our general and education activities. Do you expect that the university will have to rely increasingly on philanthropy as state funding drops? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ask a yes or no question and get a yes or no answer. I think that's pretty obvious to all of us in the public sector. And philanthropists are stepping up and understanding that the state doesn't pay the whole bill and it certainly doesn't pay the bill for world-renowned programs that go outside that core activity. And what will you do when you reach a limit to, to that philanthropic giving level? That's a milestone along the way. We continue to raise money for the University of Arizona. It's not a limit, it's a goal. And once achieved, we also hope to be able to increase our annual fundraising on a permanent basis. We're looking at 200 million a year eventually, and maybe more, because that's part of our future. It's a part of partnering, which is a key aspect of our academic plan and strategy. When you partner with someone then you bring their values and skills to the table along with yours. You don't just dictate and take their resources. And of course, speaking of partnership, uh, you've already mentioned Banner, which recently completed its takeover of the University of Arizona Health Network. What will the relationship between U of A and Banner be going forward? Well, we have a very explicit academic affiliation agreement, which is very, very detailed. That relationship ties our futures together very, very intimately. Banner brings world-class experience and skill at providing both inpatient and ambulatory care for populations, for the very, very best in care, and for efficiencies and effectiveness of scale and experience. 
we absolutely benefit from having that be a part of our primary clinical partner. We bring world-class research and education for the future healthcare workforce that Banner and the other providers will rely upon in Arizona going into the future. So each of us brings to the table something very different from the other. And we've made some very, very strong commitments to each other, including shared employment with workload established by analyzing exactly what each person is, is contributing, whether it be clinical, whether it be teaching, or whether it be research, to management of our uh, outpatient clinics and our inpatient care. That partnership is captured in an academic affiliation agreement and a commitment to an academic management council that will have central responsibility for our core hospital in Phoenix and our core hospital facilities, two of them here in Tucson. That's a big agreement and it deliberately makes a, a breakup very difficult because we knew that we were all going to have to make some changes in the way we do things. And if it was easy to separate, the temptation would be to separate. And what was the impetus for the merger? Well, it's complex. Uh, I've had experience prior to coming to Tucson as the president of a university with a medical school and uh, a health system. And very clearly over the, the last decade, the trend in reimbursement patterns, and especially with the Affordable Care Act and its passage in the entire national landscape, that what we receive compensation for doing and the impacts that that has on individual patients, but also groups of patients, have changed dramatically since our current system was, was developed shortly after World War II. So I came in knowing that we had to have a future. There was no primary clinical partner in Phoenix. And to have no primary clinical partner and yet try and build a, a truly research and education-based uh, bulwark in American medical education was a, no, was a non-starter. So we knew we had to do something there and had been working on it since I arrived. When we began to have the conversation about what the future looked like in Tucson, then this incredibly crazy idea to ask a single world-class partner to take on two medical schools in two different cities, in two major mar markets, gradually emerged in our conversations. And as an access to capital means for the Tucson clinical care enterprise, for a long-term solution to the funds flow agreements that are necessary for a great medical school to happen, we knew we had to do something revolutionary. And that was what brought us to the current agreement. And what will be the financial implications of the takeover for the University of Arizona? Well, fundamentally, we preserve the funds flows that were traditionally a part of the Tucson School of Medicine relationship with the University of Arizona Health Network. We also have a long-term agreement that adds $40 million of brand new revenue right off the top. $20 million totally at the discretion every year of the senior leadership in, in health sciences at the university, and $20 million in addition that will be d invested in the clinical enterprise of the academic division. So those are new resources to our two medical schools. And our relationship with the providers in Phoenix is new, and that funds flow and that access to world-class care are both completely new and tremendous for us. Recall that, in addition, Banner has made some pretty significant capital commitments to Tucson that could not have happened without an infusion of capital from a clinical provider that had sufficient operating margin and in a not-for-profit context to be able to invest. And that's where an entirely new hospital wing, which was announced just recently with the concept uh, uh, drawings, is going to be available to Tucson that would never have been available otherwise. And 
multi-practice ambulatory care facilities where a cancer patient with heart disease doesn't have to drive all the way across greater Tucson to see two different doctors who, who actually act, need to coordinate care in, in those multidisciplinary environments. So your nephrologist who's taking care of your kidneys and your cardiologist who's worried about a cat lab intervention actually talk to each other about your kidneys and kidney failure before something happens. Those are incredible innovations and they would never have happened without the infusion of capital that Banner brought to the table. All right. Well, Dr. Hart, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. My pleasure. I'll talk to you about my favorite topic, which is the University of Arizona, anytime. <laughs>